Okay. So this is the W3C WebRTC Working Group meeting for April. And we have two hours today and a whole bunch of stuff to get through. So a reminder about the IPR policy, we abide by it and only people and companies listed on the page are allowed to make substantive contributions. So here's what we're gonna try to go through. Uh, we will have a discussion on integration of WebNN with Media Capture Transform, um, some issues in WebRTC extensions and WebRTC PC, uh, Harold will talk about voice isolation, and then we have a lot with suggested content hint and avoid user confusion. Uh, and then UN will uh, talk about region capture. Um, if we time permits, uh, Yanni Bar has some slides as well. Um, and if time doesn't permit, we have meetings coming up on May 17th, the 21st of June and July 19th, uh, and we can get to whatever we don't get to today. Okay, uh, so the slides as usual are up on the wiki uh, and we do need a note taker. Do we have a volunteer? I can take note. Okay, thank you very much, Ewan. Okay, so a little bit about the code of conduct. We operate under it. We're all passionate about improving over GC, but let's try to keep it cordial and professional. Um, as we mentioned, the meeting's being recorded. Um, if you, uh, we, we are trying to manage the queue, so type plus Q and minus Q in Google Meet chat, and I don't know, is that Harold? Uh, anyway, Harold, can you manage the queue? Uh, I can do that. Okay, thank you very much. And please state your name, it'll help us figure it out. So a little bit about document status. We just try to tell everyone that just because something's in a W3C repo doesn't mean it's been adopted. We've been having a call for adoptions on this uh, and editor's drafts don't represent working group consensus, working group drafts do. Um, and it is possible to merge PRs that lack consensus if you attach a note indicating that. Okay, so here uh, I mentioned what we're gonna try to get through today. It's a lot of stuff. So we are gonna try to keep uh, time fairly strictly. Um, and uh, I'll try to do it, maybe Harold. Uh, we'll see if uh, we need to keep on track though. All right, so first item is WebNN uh, Media Capture Transform Integration. I know, uh, our, do, we, uh, do you wanna present this? I, I added some slides just for background. Uh, maybe I'll present those. I guess, Dom, you opened the issue on November 10th, and the idea was to build a prototype integrating Media Capture Transform with uh, TensorFlow.js, a background blur, um, and then measure performance. Uh, and the focus was on video because that's where we think the, the issues would crop up, if there are any. So, um, so this was done, and this is what a uh, discussion of what it all means is coming up. So if you look at the thread, there are several issues that were raised. One was garbage collection. Uh, there is a PR that's in progress about that. It turns out um, that uh, it helps if you report video frame external memory as released when you call video frame .close. Um, And uh, it apparently improves the garbage collection and doesn't uh, create as big a spike. That PR is not merged yet, so you wouldn't see that. Another thing is copy removal. Um, and I guess we'll discuss more about this um, if we understand it. And I guess, uh, Dom, you thought that probably a bunch of copies going on from the GPU to the CPU. I guess we'll explore that more. And the third issue was WebNN, Web GPU integration, and whether we're using the right uh, uh, textures and shaders and all that stuff uh, to do this. Okay, so I guess uh, there is a sample app up there where you can look at things uh, and get your own idea of how things perform. Uh, it integrates breakout box with various transforms, including WebGL, WebGPU, uh, stuff like that. Um, and I guess you, you do have to, for the web and end, you do have to go in and Chrome flags and enable that specific feature or it, it won't be available. So that, yeah. that, that feature is, a, it is of course, a release now. It yeah. It doesn't work in a worker yet. Right. 
uh, although I think what we're dealing with here may not need that yet, although that was one of the goals. Okay. Um, so why don't, why don't we just get into the, if you want to uh, talk to this uh, slide, and then we, there's some other slides we can get into. I guess there were questions about the details. Uh, Ninchin. Uh, yes, I'm Ala. Yeah. So yeah, so uh, my name is Ninchin Hu. Uh, I'm uh, working for Intel, um, and now I'm participating in the uh, WCC web machine learning working group with uh, uh, NC there. Um, I'm a co-editor of the uh, web spec there. So. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, uh, Bernard. So I think for, uh, the, yeah, yeah, actually this slide is, is uh, like a high level um, pipeline and there's uh, some components there to uh, build up with this uh, uh, video uh, processing um, pipeline, um, specifically for the um, background blur um, uh, uh, feature there. So uh, uh, actually the uh, boxes here actually are marked with some um, some like a GPU texture or a wixel so that uh, actually this is a web GPU version with a WebM capability, a WebM graph uh, uh, interface there. So basically this is a web GPU plus WebM uh, processing pipeline. And in the screenshot Bernard just showed, uh, there uh, uh, is another uh, pipeline uh, that using um, um, WebGL uh, for the processing, and the, for that pipeline, the uh, segmentation and uh, here the the ML graph per uh, infer um, step in that pipeline is uh, as a TensorFlow dot uh, JS WebGL um, uh, WebGL um, backend there. So yeah, so so basically the um, this pipeline is running. Uh, we have two um, versions. One is running in the main thread, another uh, is running in the uh, Walker. So the screenshot and the, uh, the link uh, just uh, shared is uh, uh, for the worker, but uh, basically the uh, pipeline uh, code and the steps uh, are same. So um, yeah, so in uh, in the transform uh, callback, so basically we got the video frames, and we uh, ha have the first step is import that uh, video frame. So basically, yeah, the import here is uh, like um, just a, a function, but. Uh, uh, actually, uh, underlying uh, a current uh, a demo we uh, sample, we use uh, uh, two APIs. The first is create an image uh, uh, image bitmap from that video frame. Then we use uh, uh, in the uh, in the web geo case, so we uh, use uh, the the texture uh, 2D. Uh, if uh, let, let me see, uh, uh, yeah, the uh, text image 2D to upload that uh, uh, video uh, image bitmap to a uh, uh, WebGL uh, texture. And uh, in the uh, web G, uh, GPU plus uh, WebM case, uh, we use a copy external image to texture uh, API there. Uh, then we ha have a GPU texture. So um, in, in the GPU texture, basically we do a two processing. One is uh, just a blur the whole image. And, and uh, that, that takes uh, a video frame and uh, te uh, texture and uh, and, and uh, blur that uh, uh, into another um, uh, 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 GPU texture. If we focus on here, the uh, web G, uh, GPU pipeline. And on, yeah, so uh, so um, on another pass because we need to uh, figure out uh, which pixel is a background, which pixel is a foreground, right? So we uh, first we need to uh, run some machine learning uh, models there. So we use another shader, for example, in in this uh, in this pipeline to uh, to so-called tensor uh, tensorize this uh, uh, GPU texture into a uh, into a tensor that can be taken for the um, for the uh, ML uh, execution. For example, they have some um, some some requirement for the input for that uh, uh, machine learning model. So we need uh, uh, that, for example, do some normalization and uh, some uh, turn it to like a, a uh, flow the point and uh, do some like uh, uh, normalization and uh, uh, standardization, something like this. So yeah, then we turn it uh, all this uh, pixel um, in that texture into a GPU buffer. Then we feed that into um, uh, uh, the WebM graph. Um, uh, here, uh, as Bern mentioned, that we depend on the interop API between uh, WebM and uh, the uh, Web GPU. So uh, the WebM graph there can take a, a Web GPU buffer as the input. Uh, then uh, uh, that graph, we infer that graph, uh, it uh, um, will uh, output uh, 
the so-called segmentation map into another GPU buffer that basically tell you uh, which pic, uh, uh, which object of that pixel uh, it, it is. For example, it's a background or it's a, it's another object because we're using a, a deep lab v3 model that can tell you um, that, that can uh, classify that each pixel into up to 20 uh, 21 um, um, uh, classes. So if I remember. So yeah, uh, correctly. Then uh, uh, another um, uh, shader uh, take uh, this two um, together, like uh, the, um, the uh, uh, actually the three inputs together, the uh, original video um, texture, the blurred video, uh, the, the GPU texture, uh, blurred texture, and the uh, uh, segmentation map. And based on that to, um, to, create, uh, to create out the output that's uh, like a pixel uh, pick the, um, a pixel from from the origin um, uh, 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 origin texture yeah, if the pixel is uh, like a foreground and uh, take uh, pick up the um, pixel from the blurred texture if uh, this pixel is classified as a background then this uh, all seems will be um, draw into an off screen canvas uh, as the last step was uh, that um, after this is all done so uh, 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 this example will and uh, create a, a video, a new video frame from this canvas, and uh, uh, feed that into the controller that uh, um, passed uh, from the uh, transform callback. Then that's uh, basically the, the the pipeline. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, yeah. So uh, 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 as I mentioned, that uh, the, uh, the 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 WebGL um, pipeline is uh, basically similar, uh, but uh, the segmentation is by uh, is done by a uh, WebGL um, shader um, that's uh, implemented by TensorFlow.js WebGL backend. And uh, uh, there is also a, a to do that we want to uh, also do this for the Web GPU because TensorFlow.js also has a Web GPU uh, backend, but uh, Due to some um, gaps there, so uh, this is uh, uh, not done yet. Uh, will be done as the next step. Uh, so far, we tested uh, like uh, the pure uh, web GPU, uh, web GPU backend, and uh, the uh, web GPU plus uh, WebM execution. So um, yeah, today, yeah. So that's uh, the the high level uh, uh, description of this uh, um, uh, this pipeline. Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the, some uh, bullets here uh, share that we basically uh, profiled uh, um, the, the, um, the, the this sample. We yeah also Dom read that there um, um, uh, looks like some um, not so very uh, low uh, CPU usage there. And, and no no matter you run it on main thread or in a worker. So yeah, basically after profiling, we see that there like uh, the 35 or um, Percent of CPU usage in this uh, uh, in this sample actually uh, spent on the create image map, and another twenty um, spent on the GC. So yeah, so yeah, we, we are wondering re whether we can uh, improve that by like a, a you know the create image map is used for the uh, video uh, frame import to uh, uh, to a uh, uh, GPU texture. So yeah, so so actually there um there are I I, I was told that there are co co copies there because there are some like a, a color convention or other um uh, other um and, uh, processing that uh, turn to uh, turn a video frame into a texture uh, with, with a cop uh, with a copy. So yeah, so that that, that um, may, may maybe one area we want to improve. Uh, I, I was told that there are some new API like uh, um, import uh, uh, external uh, image to texture, something like this uh, will be introduced in uh, web uh, GPU uh, as an extension. Or so, yeah, so uh, uh, we will um, test that out uh, if it is in place. And and also on the on the GC part, so um, yeah, Bernard shared that there are some efforts to improve the uh, video frame side because you see there are video frame uh, we got a video frame and also we create a video frame um, uh, as end right and also there are some like uh, some uh, objects allocated to um, to uh, to run this uh, uh, web GPU pipeline for example uh, we we uh, we uh, when every uh, video frame input to our texture uh, we create a view and also uh, re um, reband it to the uh, to the band group of the web GPU um, uh, pipeline to run the shader uh, so uh, yeah, so uh, probably there can uh, be improved that uh, to reduce uh, this kind of uh, 
uh, dynamic uh, objects uh, allocation during this process. So that's another um, uh, area um, probably can be explored. So I, 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 just, just, just my thought, I'm thinking on the high level uh, whether we can have some like uh, some uh, some configuration or a setup before the pipeline running. That's uh, for example, we said that uh, where is uh, um, the video frame uh, to import or uh, the, all the like uh, the, the buffers, the textures uh, uh, be used uh, uh, for this pipeline. Then when the, this pipeline run, just uh, we, yes to, to to run it uh, uh, um, as a setup instead of uh, create something uh, in, in the fly when the processing uh, in the in the processing uh, pipeline uh, inside itself, right? So that, that may be yes. Yeah, so some some areas uh, uh, can 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 be think about. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the 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 last thing, but the, not the um uh yeah the that last thing is about some uh, some uh, some performance uh, issue I observed during this uh, um, development. I observed on some entry level GPU that to run the WebGL based pipeline that actually um, put a, a high pressure on the um, GPU uh, for this uh, like uh, for this uh, uh, pipeline. So it uh, may cross the whole browser's uh, browser's harm. Uh, without like uh, ha have some mechanisms that can control this uh, like like kind of flow control um because uh, for example if this process is too heavy uh, probably it can uh, uh, slow down the, the frame feeding to this uh, processing pipeline so yeah so that's uh, the thing i would like to share so yeah so that's all i was pause here Yeah, so I had a question. Uh, you mentioned the import has a copy, and we can see that. And I guess there's a proposal uh, to go directly from the video frame to the GPU external texture. How about the output? Is there a copy there as well? Um, the you know the off, to the off-screen canvas and then to the export to video frame. Uh, I'm not sure actually, so I need some education here, or as uh, a web GPU expert uh, can, yeah, can chime in. Yeah, I'm just wondering if we need to do a yeah. conversion what, both ways or just one way. I believe uh, uh, to uh, both bo both ways. We need okay. uh, the so input and the export. Ways. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have one question. Nice. Uh, sorry, Tim Pantan was in the queue before you. Oh. Yeah, we, we've got, <laughs> got two queues. Uh, I'm probably in the wrong one. Uh, so just, I know this is very subjective, but what's the, um, was the performance acceptable? Like, do we really have to be pushing down to get the ex the performance massively better? Or, or is this like in the right ballpark and we just need to tweak it a little? I think that's for you. Okay, so yeah, so my take is uh, um, probably because this is a long run um, same. Probably we need to measure that is uh, like a power or a battery uh, impact on this. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, uh, this is uh, like a one. Uh, as I know, is one uh, 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 like the same uh, people are interested in that uh, how this uh, like a video uh, processing or video conference uh, um, uh, application consume your power or or drain your um, battery, right? So, so that, that that thing we need to figure out. But but we don't know that yet. But uh, um, maybe uh, Dom uh, highlight uh, emphasis the CPU usage is one aspect of that. So yeah, so it's my take. So my idea is to if we can reduce the. Uh, uh, the, the power consumption as uh, uh, less as possible that will be um, good to improve the ex user experience because that, that people actually um, I, I heard some feedback from from that side so yeah uh, I'll comment quickly on, on what we're doing with this prototyping uh, I think we are doing two things one is uh, checking what improvement we can get by using hardware accelerated uh, neural network processing with WebNN. Uh, the other thing we're doing is uh, evaluating some of the roadblocks, anyone that might be using Media Capture Transform 
uh, might be hitting when doing uh, video processing, in particular when trying to do uh, full GPU video processing, uh, because these memory copies that uh, appear here are not specific to <laughs> Uh, background blur or to machine learning processing they are really anytime you want to apply some gpu processing to to a, a video frame um and more recently some of the questions around for instance uh, pixel format and color space conversion that are implicit in the diagram that uh, ninching is presenting have surfaced uh, in other places and i think will impact or uh, architecture down the line. So uh, uh, that's the two ways I'm looking at this uh, prototype and its uh, current performance results. And I believe we have uh, UN in the queue. Yeah, so I'm looking at the GC, which is 20% uh, and so on. And um, I, I'm wondering whether that's um, that's something that is uh, like, that can be fixed by implementations uh, underneath uh, JavaScript, or whether there's uh, an issue with uh, creation of uh, a lot of objects very repetitively, like for every frame, you're, you're creating a GPU buffer and so on. Like, and it's happening a lot. And what usually is done with uh, native implementations is you have a, a buffer pool. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether uh, this is something that should be surfaced uh, to JavaScript applications or whether user agents will be smart enough to use buffer pools underneath uh, in, in implementations so that this uh, GC and perf issues uh, are, are decreased a lot. Yeah, so uh, to answer the, the first question that uh, um, the GPU buffer actually I allocated uh, uh, before the uh, processing uh, uh, pipeline running. So basically in, in, in the setup stage, so all the uh, GPU buffers uh, are allocated. But uh, there is, uh, like uh, as I mentioned, there are some uh, theme that's created uh, uh, for every frame that is uh, we import uh, a video frame into a GPU texture. Then we need uh, uh, to get this uh, uh, texture and uh, view and uh, band into the uh, like uh, the uh, uh, band group of that uh, uh, processing pipeline. Uh, that I believe will uh, um, create some new objects there for for every frame. So that that's why I um, uh, have uh, some high level idea whether we can have uh, like uh, some something to um, to band this uh, like uh, before the pipeline, then we just uh, can, like, like a developer can specify where is the uh, video importance the destination. Probably we can get it uh, pre-allocated uh, buffer or texture there, then just uh, um, populate that buffer without uh, create uh, it uh, uh, every time, right? Uh, then the uh, GPU, um, I mean the uh, web GPU, uh, processing pipeline could be like uh, uh, could like be, uh, could like be static uh, without a change um, for every frame. So I believe that will avoid uh, many new objects allocation. So yeah, so that's my take. So uh, but uh, I'm not sure that uh, underlying implementation side uh, optimization uh, would help. So so I believe so, but uh, I don't have uh, many um, experience or source there. So. Uh, Ninchin, since there is no one else in the queue, uh, I wonder, can, can you say maybe a bit uh, more about the next steps in that project? What, what kind of timeline do you expect for future iterations? Uh, so oh, there, there are two um, two items uh, currently in the, uh, my to-do list. Uh, one is uh, like uh, uh, to enable the web GPU, um, uh, TensorFlow.js backend uh, uh, in this pipeline. So we have a uh, we, 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 we can understand that uh, how this can work with uh, like a WebGL, uh, we already have that, then work with the pure uh, WebGPU processing, then with uh, a WebGPU plus uh, uh, webin there. So that's uh, um, one thing. So we have, uh, um, um, we have uh, um, uh, 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 the P PR uh, in uh, work in progress that to fix that in the TensorFlow.js uh, WebGPU backend. So um, that's one uh, item. 
another one, uh, as I mentioned, is that uh, uh, there is a, uh, so I was told there is a new API that can import uh, uh, the external, uh, Bernard just mentioned that, uh, to ex import uh, a video frame as an external um, texture to, um, to, uh, to, to web GPU. So yeah, so I will try to um, uh, to use that and uh, see whether we can reduce uh, the um, the um, uh, the uh, create image uh, bitmap uh, um, uh, cost on the CPU to, uh, to see how how far we can go. And yeah, so I, that's the media uh, uh, two steps I think about. Another one probably is uh, uh, we, we can also measure that. Uh, uh, Bernard shared that uh, P, uh, there is a sale in Chromium that to uh, fix the video frame or improve the video frame uh, GC um, uh, scenario. So uh, probably we can also try it once that uh, merged. So to to report out uh, what what we found. So yeah, so that's basically uh, the things uh, in my mind. So yeah, so I also want to hear uh, feedbacks here. So anything. I missed or uh, we should uh, uh, find out more. So, yeah. Uh, Chris Cunningham, do you have any comments? Hey y'all, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with a sick kid over here. I'm kind of a fly on the wall, but I'm not paying a close attention to be helpful. Okay. Um, so I have one more comment since we are talking about uh, CPU efficiency and so on. Um, so currently you're doing ping pong between main thread and, and, and worker thread. So I'm guessing that it, it might be small, but maybe it's not neg negligible as well. So maybe when everything will be done in a worker, you will uh, transfer the, the media stream track and do everything in a worker. Uh, then maybe there will be a, a small uh, perf improvement as well. So that might be worth uh, experimenting when it's available. Uh, so I'm sorry. So uh, I, uh, my understanding, uh, uh, we, uh, we, uh, as I shared, we have a worker version of this, uh, of this one. So uh, in that one, actually, I believe we already transfer the media track to that uh, worker. Then all the like a process is happening uh, on worker in Walker without uh, uh, transfer um, objects between the main thread and the Walker uh, in the pro, uh, in the processing pipeline. So I'm not sure is that uh, uh, you suggest that we we do or or we we already uh, have that in place. So oh okay, I I, I thought Chrome was uh, did not have support yet for for that, but may, maybe it has already and you're using it. Then then it's great if you're uh, transferring the track. That, that's great to hear. Okay, cool. Okay. Well, they may be transferring so think, the streams, but yeah, maybe. So I guess my main takeaway items is potentially look at that conversion. I know uh, there was a, uh, a PR proposed for web codex to do the conversion. Uh, and I think one of the questions was whether we knew exactly what the conversion ought to be. Are you saying that if if we did the conversion between video frame and GPU external texture, that would be used by WebMN, and and that's the one we that's the conversion we want, back and forth. Uh, if the yeah, so for WebM uh, currently the interop uh, interface is designed to um, take the uh, web GPU uh, buffer or web GPU texture. So if uh, right. the conversion yeah already done that, so WebM can take. I think, yeah. Okay. All right, I think uh, time is up for this item, but thank you very much, Ningxin. No problem, uh, yeah. Thank and you. we will move on uh, to discussion of some WebRTC extensions and WebRTC PC items. Um, here's what we are gonna try to get through. Um, two items on WebRTC extensions and then a bunch of simulcast issues that have cropped up. Okay, so issue 95 uh, was about uh, potentially deprecating audio video enumeration and get capabilities in favor of the media capabilities API. Um, this is issue 95 in Weber to see extensions. Um, and then we also have issue 185, which was in media capabilities, which is about retrieving RTC, RTP codec capability from media capabilities when you query it with type WebRTC. Um, so, uh, I think we've 
pretty much concluded how to do that, which is that you use the content type value to represent the audio and video codecs uh, with stuff like profile ID in the content uh, type so that it provides the RTC, RTP codec capability much as it would in get capabilities. Um, and then you get the result returned from media capabilities, uh, which provides the RTC, RTP codec capability dictionary. Um, and you can then use that in as input to set codec preferences to set your preferred video codec. So that's basically how how things are designed. And this is an example out of 185, where essentially uh, you put in the media config uh, and you put in your content type. In this case, the audio one is audio opus and you put in your channels and your bit rate and sample rate. And then uh, for video, this one is VP9 with profile ID one. Uh, and then as usual in media capabilities, you put in the width, height, bit rate and frame rate. Um, and then you, you call media capabilities, in this case, uh, the decoding side, and you get back a result. Um, and the, your uh, RTC, RTP media capabilities is in the uh, web RTC codec uh, member. So this is basically how, how things are proposed to work. Um, so uh, there are a few differences though, um, which is that media capabilities currently returns information relating to classic audio and video codecs like Opus, VP8, VP9, H264, et cetera. Um, whereas uh, get capabilities returns a bunch of other stuff like header extensions um, and the codex portion returns things that you wouldn't think of as a classic audio video codec like uh, DTMF, uh, you know, telephone event, comfort noise, uh, ULP fec, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, other RTX red um, stuff like that. So it's it's more stuff than is in media capabilities at the moment. Um, so here's an example of what media capabilities looks like. As you can see, this is an you have an example of audio red um, and then comfort noise with two different clock rates uh, and uh, telephone event with two different clock rates. I guess one is for Opus and one is for uh, G711. Uh, G722. Here's what it looks like on the video side, where you, it returns RTX, um, red, ULP FEC, and then uh, flex, fan, flex FEC as well. Um, so here are the here are the questions uh, for the working group. So, um, you know, basically the overall question is: Is it a goal for media capabilities to actually encompass? get capabilities and deprecate it. Is that a goal? Uh, and if so, do should media capabilities for WebRTC provide all information on all the codecs? So telephone event, comfort noise, FEC, RTX, I read all that stuff. Uh, and then does, if, it, if it, we were to do that, would the results make sense? So would the, these non-codec codecs, would they ever be power efficient or smooth? Um, and then there's a question of uh, would with height, frame rate, bit rate, would that stuff ever affect the results? Um, so I guess we want to open it up for discussion. Uh, let's see who we have in the queue. Uh, you are in the queue. Well, why don't you manage? Can you manage the queue, Dom? Thanks. Um, so my, my understanding is that uh, media capabilities is really about uh, audio and video codecs, and that's all. So I don't think it makes sense to uh, expose CN or DTMF in uh, media capabilities. Uh, so that, that should say in media capability, that should say in get capabilities. But all the uh, audio video codecs, the real ones like uh, AV1 and so on, uh, um, media capabilities is a better place. So that's where I would like uh, the web to move. Uh, when you query audio or video codecs, you go to media capabilities. And when you have like web specific stuff, you, could, you go to get capabilities. And that will uh, solve some issues that we have with uh, get capabilities. For instance, it is a synchronous API, and it's it's okay with uh, CN, FEC, and so on, because they're, they're done in software, and we we know really easily whether they're available or not. 
Uh, but for hardware codecs, uh, it's more difficult to do that synchronously. And uh, media capabilities being promise based, it's, it's a bit better. So uh, that's, that's my answer. So no, it's not a goal to deprecate it, to fully deprecate it. But yes, it's a goal to partially deprecate get capabilities. I think Florent, you were in the queue. Uh, yes. Um, so I agree with some of the points that you had made. Uh, media capabilities should probably not have um, RTX, FEC, and all of those uh, non standard real codecs. Uh, but I do believe that we need a place for to have those. And at the moment, uh, it is get capabilities. I agree that get capabilities is not a great API as it is not a sync. And uh, when querying it, it might, results may be delayed and it doesn't really work with a synchronous API. And I think we should probably focus on fixing that rather than trying to add um, API media capabilities, which is uh, made for a specific request about a specific codec rather than listing all the different codecs that we have. Um, if we tried, for example, to use, um, if we didn't have any uh, API for listing all the codecs and try to get similar uh, use to set codec preferences as we have now, we would need to make many calls to media capabilities to get all the WebRTC codecs uh, in order to construct the array of codecs that we want to pass to set codec preferences. And that would be a big uh, usability regression. So we would probably need to address uh, those um, issues as well. Uh, Chris? Hey, um, sorry, I got uh, a moment away from my kid for a second. Uh, I just want to say that uh, for my part as the media capabilities editor, uh, Ewan's and it, it seems like you and, and uh, um, sorry, I forget the name of the person who just spoke, are, are mostly aligned. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm fine with that outcome for media capabilities to be focused on uh, you know, real codecs, if you will, and uh, to, to leave the other codecs to the domain of good capabilities. Um, there is an interesting question still about, uh, do you want to return the RTC codec info uh, from media capabilities. I, I think uh, the, the previous uh, speaker kind of was uh, circling that question. Um, if the answer to that question is yes, uh, I do want to ask that uh, you and, and uh, you know other folks on this call take a look at the media capabilities issue um, where I'm trying to uh, really nail down the steps on how to disambiguate uh, the input for media capabilities to, uh, you know, reliably produce a RTC codec info, if that is a desirable outcome. Um, uh, Ewan, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think it's a desirable outcome. I think I filed an issue about that. So it's great that you're working on it. And yes, we should be able to, we need to disambiguate uh, the, the outcome because uh, it's useful for WebRTC, but it might be also useful in the future for, um, web codex plus web transport for WebRTC like uh, applications as well. Um, to get back to Florent's point about being able to uh, list all uh, video codecs or all audio codecs that WebRTC supports, I think it's a non-goal. We, we want to move away from that. Media capabilities is really about uh, you as an application, you have you are an SFU, so you're probably supporting a, a few a few codecs and that's the ones you actually want to uh, to check with media capabilities. It will be a few calls for media capabilities, and you have promised all that will solve uh, most of the issues there. So I don't think it's a usability uh, trouble for SFU applications. For peer-to-peer -peer cases, I would think that you might not need set codec preferences at all, because um, you want to expose all codecs, and then VSDP negotiation to happen and uh, pick the, the best codec between the two um, Peer to peer endpoints. So that, that's why I think that uh, not exposing get capability, uh, real codecs in get capabilities 
uh, it's we are a long way from from that but i think it's a, it's a desirable goal uh, and not listing all uh, codecs that are supported uh, uh, with just one call okay uh, i think we, it sounds like we got an answer to the questions on this slide which is uh, that uh, we Media capabilities doesn't have to provide information on all the fake codecs, uh, and it's not a goal to deprecate capability, get capabilities, or get rid of get capabilities, but just to uh, provide enhanced info. So I think we can we can move on to issue 100. Uh, wait, wait, you, yeah. you have yeah. a long queue of people that want to. Okay. Yaniva, <laughs> uh, Harald, and Flora. Uh, yes, sorry. So I thought Bernard had a good point that we could uh, maybe move on and that the, we have answered this slide, but I think some good points were raised by UN. But I think uh, that we do have a problem where get capabilities is synchronous. And so it sounds like um, it, it'd be good to clarify that um, if we do, there seems to be a sole goal of if we deprecate real codecs from uh, sender get capabilities. Uh, that would solve the asynchronous problem that we have. And I think that sounds like a good long-term goal for me. And if there are usability issues with using media capabilities for this, we should probably look at that in a media capability spec to, to streamline that there. That's my input, thanks. Harald? I do worry that uh, uh, the, we, with all this uh, stuff about RTX Red and Fake, we need to have that information somewhere. I mean, if we keep get capabilities around, we have a method that has known problems uh, as the only, the recommended and only way to get that information. And uh, I worry a bit about uh, about uh, the leave it just leaving get capabilities in there because uh, uh, because making uh, changes to get, get capabilities is actually harder than deprecating it because it will be a most confusing change to the users and one of the issues with get capabilities is actually its finger fingerprintability uh, so uh, if we keep both around, then uh, uh, and we kind of uh, have a direction to say that, uh, OK, real codecs go into media capabilities. And uh, but uh, we still then still don't have a badly designed interface for the rest of the stuff. So we're teeing up more work. That might be okay. We might be a, need a completely different way of thinking about the problem of getting the, the additional information. So in the long run, it should be, I, don't, I think get capabilities should be deprecated and removed, but we need to have functionality that covers everything it covers. I think that's all I have, all I worry about at this moment. Otherwise, I'm happy with the conclusions. And um, uh, I would say that, yes, as you mentioned, uh, you and there's uh, two different scenarios uh, where um, people would use um, set correct preferences. One would be um, when a peer is talking to an SFU, and in this case, you want, you know which codecs you would target, and then you can make uh, target specific queries to media capabilities, uh, if I understood you correctly. Uh, in the peer-to-peer -peer scenario, you might have a different behavior, and uh, I believe right now, if you're not able to enumerate uh, all the codecs, you will not be able to call um, set codec preferences really. Uh, you would need to hard code a list of codecs for, but you would need to um, check, and I don't think that's really usable. 
and we'll need something uh, different. Is there a way to get the capabilities to evolve in a different shape that would satisfy everyone? Uh, that's probably a direction that I would like to uh, see if it's possible. There's also a lot of usage of uh, get capabilities currently with a code preferences. So the application will be difficult. Yeah. So my uh, suggestion to everybody is to bring some of these great ideas uh, to the GitHub issue and or maybe fork another one. Uh, I would like to try to get to the uh, issue 100, which Sergio put in. Can can we move? OK, so this is issue 100, um, which is inactive by default codex. Uh, and Sergio put in the use case here, which is he's adding VP9 profiles 1 and 3 and H264 uh, high, two of those. Uh, and then you get this enormous STP. Um, so uh, the question is, uh, is there a way to have some of these codecs disabled by default so they don't always appear in the offer if you're not interested in them? Um, and FIPO notes that uh, you know, they've had these problems before. You can run out of payload types in the upper range. Uh, we talked about issue 99, I think, uh, last month. Uh, and, and this is a very similar problem. So uh, this was some of the ideas that were put forward uh, to fix this. And so kind of like to open this up to discussion. You have any comments, Sergio? No, I mean, I think that I just wanted to write the issue, but I mean, because the SDP was huge. And I think that as people, as Philip has said, this has very or similar to to what we have in the header extension. So probably we can reuse or use a similar API in both, but I don't have any preference of a, over the solution that uh, we could uh, implement. Uh, you in? Um, yeah, in, in general, uh, I think it might be fine. My main worry is uh, what, are the, what are the defaults? Would, would they be the same for all browsers? And uh, some, some, brow some uh, codecs are now the default, but, but at some point we might want to make them uh, uh, off, off by default, like uh, legacy codecs and so on. So how do we envision this evolution? Uh, and uh, this, this might create web compat issues as well. Uh, so that's, what, what's the solution there? What, what, what are your thoughts there? At least the one that I am using, uh, uh, some, some of them, for example, are receive only. So I think that this are, is already handled inside the WebRTC, for example, the, the s 264 high profile, something like that. Uh, I think that the ones that, mm, I don't know, I mean, probably just common sense. I mean, probably not everyone is going to use VP9 profile one, two, three, or is 264 high profile. So probably maybe those are uh, off by default, but uh, and, and have in, and, and we can have the same, the, the other ones uh, enabled by default as for, as for now. But I don't know, I don't have a strong opinion on that. Just to mention that the case where that I'm worrying is uh, the peer-to-peer -peer case, mm -hmm. where uh, if the defaults are different between two uh, user agents at some point, even though both user agents are supporting H264, for instance, uh, they will not use it because uh, one is off by default and not the other one, and there will be no available video codecs uh, that, that are com in common in the SDP. So that's that, why we, we need to have like clear rules uh, about how we are handling this. Yeah, but I think that the, the, here at least my proposal was to have off by default in the offer, but if you receive it in the in the offer, you can add it in the in the answer. So it is just what a uh, codes do you do you uh, do you provide in the offer? So for example, in in this case, if you receive an offer with uh, I will say it, BPM BP9 profile three, uh, you will be able to to answer that in the in the in the in the answer, but you will not offer it by default. So in this case, in the peer-to-peer, -peer, you will be able 
to negotiate even with even with a code that you don't have enabled because um, it, the, the enable the enabling is only for the ones for the codes that are going to go into the offer, not in the answer. Uh, we have Harold in the queue. Yeah, so uh, looking at the the way this this is set up, uh, you need two interfaces. One is the uh, the list of co of uh, codecs you're currently will willing to offer, and one is the set of codecs that you can offer. Where well, get capability is probably uh, suffices for the first one, and the and the and the one on the screen probably suffi suffices for the second. Uh, offer by default is not needed when you have codecs to offer. It's simply what uh, codecs to offer are initialized to. And as for the interoperability, well, I think we should uh, probably push are mandatory to implement up to mandatory to offer. Even though they're all in clunky, they, they are our safety net against non-interoperability. Not saying that it's impossible to turn them off, but by default, we, we need to offer everything that's in the mandatory to implement. Uh Oh. Yeah, I look at this uh, interface and it seems like there is a lot of overlap with uh, current set codec preferences and possibly RTP sender get parameters. Is there a way to just make minimal increments to those APIs to actually satisfy the needs instead of having uh, one new uh, method and two new attributes? Uh, Sergio, I guess that was maybe for you. Yeah, I, I think that I copied that from what it is already uh, was what I was already proposed in the for the header extension. So uh, I mean, I'm fine to to uh, to move it to the to the set codec preferences, but maybe we have to move also the header extension there because I think that what would be where is to have different ways of enable uh, what codecs and an extension to offer? Right. I, I think the big difference between the header extensions and the codecs is that we have set codec preferences, but we don't have set header extension preferences or something like that. So that that's why there's some asymmetry. Yeah, yeah but, but I mean, maybe we can just add, a, add the header extension to the set codec preferences or something like that. I mean, what, what I, would, I think that it would be good is to have the same way to enable or, or very similar APIs to in, to set what codes are being offered and one header extension and not have two different, co completely different APIs for that. Yeah. Um, I think we've run out of time uh, for this section. Uh, what I would recommend for this is that we people discuss in the issue and try to come up with a concrete proposal. Is that an acceptable way to go forward? Sure. And then, and then we it, can we can bring it, it back. Or is it ready for PR? Like, if people can. I think I think it's ready for PR. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So how about ready? But let's uh, mark it ready for PR, and then people can work on the PR. Okay. Uh, so we had simulcast issues, but we'll we'll talk we'll work on that some other some other day. Okay, uh, so we have voice isolation constraints, Harold. Yeah, so this is uh, a very simple thing. I mean, we all we all know that when uh, when we're in a situation where people talk, 
the important thing is getting the voice. And uh, when you set up a microphone, you get a lot of inputs, not all of it voice. And uh, we have multiple ways of getting distinguishing between the human voice and uh, other things. I mean, frequency band analysis, uh, click elimination, and various animal approaches that came to be doing improvements. So, but, so next slide. So we have a lot of stuff that works, but uh, we have a lot of scenarios where those uh, applying those methods will produce uh, a very non-obvious and very undesired result. Try, try doing human voice isolation on an opera. Opera lovers will not be happy. So the important thing is not what exactly what you're doing. I mean, that's something that we need to leave up for invention. The important thing is, what is the desired outcome? What is, what is it that the user wants to have happen? Next slide. So, just because we have a lot of things already that we have a well-defined method of specifying that, the application wants this to happen. Let's define a new Boolean constraint, either true or false. And if it's true, define the result as attempt to remove everything that's not the human voice. May also include attempt to find the most important voice and enhance that, which might be the the guy in the middle of the camera, it might be the guy who's tallest or the one the one who's been given the floor. That's uh, quality of implementation. But uh, we need to have a way to, for the application to say, hey, user agent, help me. Isolate just the voice and everything you can throw away that is not voice whether it's Doritos chips or keyboard clicks or the siren of a police car going by, just get rid of it. Next slide. So the nice thing about constraint is that we have a nice way of feature detecting it because we just call many get media track capabilities and you get the list of supported constraints. We also have to make sure that we do the right thing with, with noise suppression. I mean, probably if you're doing vo voice isolation, you also need, you also want to remove everything that co is covered by noise, noise suppression. So when voice isolation is true, we should just ignore the property of uh, noise suppression. Next slide. So this is floating the idea to the working group. If the working group indicates that it's happy, we'll just uh, make up a pull request, uh, adding the, uh, asking for the constraint to be added and continue the discussion there. So discuss. Uh, you um, I think it, I think it makes sense that we are doing that. Um, I think it's really reasonable to uh, ignore noise suppression, so which would mean that you ignore it uh, like before applying constraint or before selecting devices and so on. Um, there's echo cancellation as well, so all, all there are like various properties for uh, that which are bricks that you 
put in the audio pipeline. And I'm, I'm wondering whether some of them are can be done serially or in parallel or, or not. And uh, one of them is echo cancellation. Does it make sense to do echo cancellation, but uh, not this property and so on as well? Uh, I am not exactly sure. Uh, so translation is is in one way rather different it's a specific source of what might sound like a human voice or might not so i would uh, i would consider that uh, mostly orthogonal that's, so just, you, that's my immediate uh, thought so on you, this yeah. so you, you you would be able to say echo cancellation false and uh voice uh suppression true for instance Yes. Okay, and vice versa. Uh, I'm guessing some implementations might might find it hard to have all the equations, like all four all four uh, values uh, implementable, uh, and we don't have a good way of uh, exposing these uh, these kind of constraints there, except by having applied constraints uh, rejecting, which is which is a bit sad. Uh, so it's another uh, issue I have with constraints, I guess. But yeah, that's yes. The, re the reporting uh, interface of uh, applied constraints uh, uh, was gutted a bit because of privacy considerations. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, we could we could do things there, I guess. But still, it's uh, yeah. Well. That's like so, um, sorry. If no one else is on the queue, uh, yes, yeah, there is the divide in the queue. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, I, I like this. Uh, we might want to remove the part to detect that the voice is actually human. But, but my real question was uh, uh, that uh, what should the default be? And uh, I guess we need to figure that out. Uh, there's some concerns there, maybe. I think uh, I'll, I'll I'll make a pull request, and we can discuss it there. My immediate uh, thinking is that a conservative approach is to say that uh, the default should be whatever we're currently doing, which means that uh, it's probably a fault, voice isolation yeah. fault, because we don't do anything extra. So I'll go write the pull requests. Yeah, done. Can, can we uh, mark it as the resolution as uh, mark issue as ready for PR as well? Seems good. Yeah, we, we haven't done so, I think, very consistently for constraints. But um, I, I wonder if instead of a Boolean, uh, a set of string values may not give us more flexibility. Uh, one could be voice isolation disabled, uh, and but for enabled values, there could be a single speaker, multiple speakers, uh, and there could be variation on that. I'm not, I'm not in, aware enough of the various ways this could be optimized, but uh, Boolean has no extensibility. Uh, strings, on the other hand, would bring us uh, potential new values over time. Uh. I do wonder about that. Um, I have to think about that. Having strings uh, also creates lots of wonderful interoperability way, ways of being non-interoperable. But uh, let's discuss that on the issue. Okay, uh, can we move on to a lot now? I'm ready if everybody else is. I guess we can. Uh, next slide, please. So, hello, uh, I'm going to discuss a suggested course, uh, content handle. It's a mix between two different features that we currently have. And uh, first, I'll remind you of the two features. So, number one, we've got content hint. 
So um, in a perfect world, you always have enough bandwidth to send um, at the top possible frame rate and resolution, and everything's just perfect. But we don't live there. And so it happens that we sometimes need to sacrifice one, if not both. And which one is preferable to the grade first depends on the context. So if you know that you're sending uh, text, uh, static uh, content like text, then it's best to just have the highest resolution possible at the cost of uh, uh, frame rate. And if you're sending video, then it's a bit more towards sending higher frame rate or at least acceptable frame rate, uh, even at the cost of relatively low resolution. And there is a mechanism currently that allows you to set which of those you would prefer to degrade first. So it's called content hint. It's exposed on track. And if you set it to text, then uh, when the bandwidth is not sufficient, you first degrade the frame rate and vice versa. Not vice versa. And conversely, for motion, you first degrade the resolution and only later the frame rate. Next slide, please. Uh, now, the second mechanism we have is called capture handle identity. And that one allows a captured tab to um, declare its identity in a free, uh, free kind of way, any string that it would like, and it can expose its origin, etc. So I think that by now it's kind of obvious how we could marry these two. Uh, next slide, please. Namely, when you capture something and you're just about to transmit it, if you were to know what you're capturing, you would know how to best encode it whether you want to optimize for resolution or for frame rate. And the problem is that unless you inspect the frames, and even when you do, you don't exactly know what you're capturing. Enter capture handle identity. Uh, now, we could kind of contort capture handle identity as it is right now to convey that information because it allows you to declare an arbitrary string. The problem is, is that an arbitrary capturer would not know how to parse that string for specifically the content hint. So I suggest that we expand uh, the capture handle so that captured content would also suggest uh, in a structured kind of way what content hint it believes would best be set on the other side. So for example, if right now we're in Meet, if I were to capture a tab with slides, then the slides uh, could say, You'd better, uh, you'd better uh, optimize for text. And if the slide knew that it was going to embed a YouTube video, then it could say promotion. And there is a bit of a pseudocode over there, and I think it's relatively clear. It's inside of the green rectangle. So basically, the capturer uh, says, hey, what is suggested? And if I trust this particular uh, um, <clears throat> tab, or if I don't care, if I trust everybody, then I just said that. And uh, that's it. That's uh, the suggestion. And uh, next slide, please. One thing to keep in mind is that if we accept this, uh, we probably also want to make sure that set capture handle config can be called more than once, which is a point of slight contention between, between us. Um, and the reason is that content can change. So for example, slides sometimes can embed text and sometimes can embed videos. Um, next slide, please. Discussion. And since nobody objects, UN is on the queue. I know, I just get it. <laughs> so uh, I think that uh, the um, Setting the track uh, hint is uh, unnecessary uh, because um, if a capture is, is setting the hint on, on its side, saying, hey, I'm a page, I'm text, then the user agent knows that it's capturing, that the track is capturing a page that says that it is text. And so it already knows the hint. So there's no need for the capturer to know, to actually know the hint. The hint might only be interesting if you're using uh, something like web codec, where maybe in that case, the user agent uh, has not uh, control of the, the, the encoder and so might 
it might become useful. But I, I don't think that in, for WebRTC, I don't think there's a, there's a need. And it might actually be uh, a bit sad that uh, applications would have to say track content hint equals something. It should be automated. It, it should be the user agent that would say, oh, I'm encoding uh, a frame that was labeled as text. So yeah, maybe let's use the, the encoder that is good at, at encoding text. So um, <clears throat> if I understood correctly, I heard two suggestions here. One of them is that you suggested that the captured content would self-declare, but that would have an automatic effect on the capturing side. Did I understand that correctly? So uh, basically, not on, the, not on the capturing side. The user agent might use that hint to uh, optimize its uh, the setup of the encoder. Yeah. Okay. So that means that basically either the user agent always believes the hint, the suggested hint, or never, right? Because the user agent is not going to give differential. Uh, treatment, whereas if you expose it to the capturing application, it can decide whether it wants to act on this suggestion or ignore it. Because user, it could be. Yeah. The, the user agent has access to the video frames. So I guess that uh, based on the output, it might say, oh, no, it's not good, or I don't know. But uh, yeah, I think that it kind of makes sense that uh, you, you, well, you have a point, but maybe the, I do not see how the capture would. Uh, no better whether to use the hint or not, but uh, I, st I still think that in any case, the user agent having access to the hint, to uh, the images, to the video frames, might do a good job at, at selecting the hint or not. That's the second thing. You also mentioned auto detection, as far as I understood. So back on the uh, how the uh, user agent versus the capturing application, which one has more information, the capturing application can check the origin and if it's an origin that it allow listed, it can say, OK, I'm going to take this suggestion. And if it has not allow listed it or even block listed it, uh, then it can just ignore the suggestion. And that's how uh, the capturing application could have more information. Uh, and for auto detection, um, that does not always work as well as hand tuning. So for example, if I've got a video playing and I know that I'm only going to play one second, then I am not going to change the suggestion. But the user agent might not know that, oh, the application has some JavaScript code that's going to stop the video one second after. So it's going to you know, oscillate between text, motion, text. And that might not be preferable. So in general, I prefer to have more flexibility. Um... Should I answer? Or I see people in the queue, so maybe Bernard and Oliver should go and then I can. Okay. Um, so I had a comment on the Web Codex case. Uh, so UN, Web Codex doesn't automatically consume content hints. Web Codex considers content hints to be generic higher level information, which the application has to translate into specific encoder settings. So it's not something that you could give to the user agent. The application would actually need to know it. The capturer would need to know the, the hint. And then it, like, as an example, if it, the content hint was text, uh, we don't have this at the moment, but it's been discussed that you would like to be able to, for example, turn on screen content coding tools. Uh, but that's a codec specific web codec setting that the application would actually need to set in response to seeing the content hint change to text. So I, I, I uh, basically support a lot's original formulation. I, I don't think this could be done by the user agent in every case. In WebRTC, it might be able to, but in Web Codex, no. Yeah, that's what I said as well. I, I said that for Web Codex, uh, exposing the hint is, might be useful, yeah. Uh, Yanivar? So, yeah, so I think, um, well, I agree with you, Ben, that uh, in, uh, the user agent is in a good place to, to um, at least short circuit the part in the green rectangle here. Um, but the, your slides, you, uh, sorry, Elad, they allude to an API on the captured side as well that you're not showing, right? That is correct. So we already have set capture handle config, uh, and that one currently just accepts origin expose or not, and an arbitrary string of the identity. And I suggest that we add one more uh, field, and that field is, uh, is called suggested content hint. And it can only accept, you know, strings which are valid content hints. Right. So, 
what, what I would propose there is that uh, getting that information from the captured application to the user agent at least uh, sounds valuable. And in that case, uh, the user agent could do this automatically, uh, at least for the case where web codex is not used. And for web codex, it sounds like we're talking about exposing metadata of the capture. So um, I have some slides, which we probably won't get to today, but that has a capture, uh, capture controller that might be a good place to surface that kind of information, uh, which would be similar to. Um, so I, I do see some, uh, it could be interesting to expose that information perhaps to as metadata of the capture somewhere. Okay, so if I understand you correctly, you're okay with exposing this to the capture uh, capturing application. You just want to continue discussing where. For instance, it could yes, be uh, frame level. Maybe. Okay. But I think we have some agreement that there's some need here, but the API shape is not clear yet in my mind. Okay, makes sense to me. Um, I think it's been 15 minutes, so unless somebody else wants to, to go, I'm ready to go to the next slide uh, section. Okay, so uh, next topic. Um, avoid user confusion by avoiding offering undesired audio sources, or basically, if you don't want system audio, don't ask for system audio. Next slide, please. So. Here's just a wall of text that basically says, currently, when you ask for a uh, screen share, you can say that the web application can say that it also wants audio. But that's a bit too coarse, because sometimes it only wants tab audio, but not system audio. For example, if a uh, um, <clears throat> video conferencing application might decide that, OK, if it's another tab, then it's very easy. I can just transmit that remotely, no echo. It works, but it, if it's system audio, echo cancellation might not work as well as it wants, as it needs, and it might not want to even ask for it. The problem is that currently we're kind of forcing the application to ask for both, and users sometimes go and actually try to turn on system audio, and when the application just ignores that audio and does not transmit it remotely, uh, users get confused. Next slide, please. So we see here, this is how it looks in Chrome. Uh, basically, if you're on Windows, both sides, both the one that says, says entire screen as well as the one that says tab, would show a checkbox asking the user if the, uh, if the user wants to share audio. Ideally, we only want, we want to, uh, to allow separate controls for whether the checkbox should prompt the user for that on the left and on the right independently. Next slide, please. Same thing. Uh, so, oh, sorry. This uh, in this slide. So, here is one suggestion of how we can do that. Uh, could you, um, could you please reload the page, Bernard? Well done. Bernard? One more slide. Yes, my apologies for making it a bit harder by making the last moment change. So uh, just an idea. It doesn't have to be exactly this API shape, but that's one API shape we can have. We can say desired sources, and then the user, the uh, web application can uh, say, OK, I only want browser. And then it gets what we see here. Or alternatively, browser and monitor, just monitor, etc. cetera. Um, that's all.
Uh, Tim is in the queue. Yeah, so uh, is this only applicable to, is it really only relevant for echo management issues? Because if so, I feel like we're addressing the wrong, in the wrong place. No, not necessarily. I mean, it could be that an application is interested in uh, recording, um, for example, for privacy reasons, right? Like maybe if you capture a specific tab and it knows via capture handle identity what you're capturing, that it, deem, it deems that safe, records that everything's okay. But if you're going to record more than that, it thinks that, hey, there is potential privacy issues here. I'm not going to save this to a file. And it just washes its hands of the entire or ordeal. I so, don't see your API addressing that use case because you you're you need two sources of info to do that. So, so if, if if you're saying that you'll only so for example, if you're saying I, I will as an app, I as a capturing app, I will um, I'm only interested in capturing audio from Google Suite apps, and I'm not not going to capture from any other origin, then I don't see that your API allows you to make that checkbox come and go in that way. I don't think you're exposing, you don't think you're exposing the right thing to do that. Uh, you're right that this was not the optimal uh, example, uh, but in that case, at least you would avoid asking for uh, audio and if you're capturing the entire system. But uh, you're right that this is, um, uh, it is not easy for me to come up with um, credible examples of how you would handle it uh, of other applications that would really need this, except for video conferencing. And I, I mean, I think that there is a problem here, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying there isn't, but I think the problem is to do with our inability to manage Echo and, and when the Echo is enabled and when it isn't, rather than to do with making this checkbox come and go. So uh, it's not necessarily just Echo, for example, it could also be that you're inside of uh, another room. So basically, you're actually two users, right? Like you're in a room uh, with your laptop and also the room has its own speakers. So it can get complicated. So even a good echo cancellation would not necessarily work there. Uh, right, but I, my point was that where this is, this is an app. Uh, this is a requirement about managing Echo rather than a requirement about the UI. And I think this changing this UI to address Echo feels like the wrong addressing the wrong solution, the wrong problem. But I mean, uh, that's just my gut instinct. I've been messing with this space for the last couple of weeks, so I'm kind of conscious of it. I understand. And it could be that in a, a perfect world where we did perfect echo cancellation, maybe we would no longer need this. But right now, uh, we're a bit limited. And what happens is that the video conferencing tools usually do not want to ask the user, or at least the ones I'm familiar with, do not want to ask the user to share system audio. But users are persistent. And the only way to communicate properly to the user, you cannot share system audio, is to just not offer system audio. So in the future, maybe this will be less useful. I agree. Uh, Yan Yiva is in the queue. Uh, yeah, so, so I, I'm actually supportive of avoiding capturing. I, I would actually prefer if browsers never captured system audio, because I feel that's a big privacy issue that users are not aware of. Um, so something like this might be desirable. I was wondering. But instead of creating a new constraint, I feel like we already have one that we could use here, which is called the uh, display server. I'm wondering if you'd thought about reusing that here. And because we have a similar debate about display surface, I have the same concerns in that debate as I have here that we should disallow monitor so that this doesn't become an API to our, for applications to request the thing we're trying explicitly to uh, discourage. Uh, I would like that, yeah, that would work for me. So basically, if I understand it correctly, you're saying exactly the same pseudo code that we see here. Instead of desired sources, we write display surface. Yes. And uh, and uh, whatever we decide on uh, in our other discussion about disallowing monitors should apply here as well, I think. But I, I would like to disallow monitor specifically here. Yeah, well, that's, that's 
that's not going to happen because Chrome currently supports that and wishes to uh, keep on supporting capturing system audio. Okay, so let me not tie it to that other conversation. I think specifically for this one, we should disallow monitor, right? I think that we can um, discuss the, uh, the current matter currently and the other matters another time. Right, because I would have a, a concern with this API if it becomes a way for the application to request system audio. But so currently it can request system audio, it just can request mm -hmm. all audio or no audio. So I think we're already making right. um, steps forward if but, we just... But the goal is to enable an application signal to say we, we don't want system audio. We shouldn't have to accept that this comes part and parcel with an API, an, AP, an app signal to say we want system audio. Well, the way I okay. see it, if, if an application wants to say that it doesn't want tab audio, that's also perfectly fine. So long as, you know, it doesn't make us ask for system audio more than we did before. Okay, well, my support for this is contingent on us not supporting monitor. I mean, I, I guess what I'm hearing is if we don't include monitor in the list of supported uh, items that doesn't mean you couldn't capture it if you don't specify anything there may still be the capture system audio option in the uh, ui but you can't ask specifically for system audio uh, as a new feature that this api would expose is that what you're saying Yaniva? uh yes so um i mean chrome is still fine to implement it the way it's doing now it's just don't want this to become a, a web compat issue where Applications are starting to depend on, um, let's say, uh, browsers in the future want to change their default to not include system audio. This shouldn't be a way to to request it. Um, but, but we could we could take this offline, I think. Yeah. So in terms of aligning with display display surface, um, I mean, in terms of namespace, in terms of value space, uh, sure. Uh, in terms of name. <laughs> display your face and audio are really a strange combination um so yeah i mean i maybe that's okay but it's a bit of a weird uh, ergonomics to speak of display your face for audio sources well the, the audio is still coming from i mean you could say the same for the values right browser and monitor are also not audio uh, right. Audio I mean, monitor is definitely strange. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I, I think that I don't think I feel strongly enough about it, but uh, okay, I mean, it's. Uh, I think that's fine in that because audio is thought of as a as a secondary thing in get display media at least currently. Is there it a always belongs for, to a display store. Is, is there a use case for window? Because it seems there's a use case for tab, and that's about it. So if that's the case, then we could be more specific. I think that eventually uh, some browsers are going to support capturing um, window audio as well. And in that case, I want applications to be able to specifically say whether they want that or not. I don't see a reason to only go for tab. I understand about system audio, and uh, I think that it's a reasonable compromise to say that if you don't specify any desired sources, you get all of them, like if you just say audio true. Uh, but if you want to specify, I'm willing to say that you can only specify browser window or browser end window. Uh, Yanivar, do we have a compromise here or? Well, I think we have some interest here. So I think we could resolve the details on, on GitHub. We could probably make this ready for PR if other people agree. Yeah, uh, just, I, just added, as, I added that as a possible label, so you can mark that. Just, just as though that uh, it sounds like what we have, in fact, is not so much that you want to specify your display surface, but whether the, the audio source is strongly tied to the display surface you've picked or, or not. Uh, and I don't know that it makes sense to say browser or window because, in fact, you would only pick one of those display surface uh, in the end. So it may be that what we are saying is audio source, a display surface, or audio source, 
uh, anything uh, which would open for system audio. Anyway, that's probably something we can refine. Yeah, the weird part here is that the correct answer to specify this to avoid system audio is a bit convoluted. You have to say desired sources, or you would also you would have to remember to always include browser and window just in case uh, a browser in the future decides to add uh, audio window, right? So it's, it's a le perhaps a less ideal surface if that's the main goal. So maybe something more specific like avoid system audio, true, false would be the barrier. Yeah, uh, that's an equivalent to what I had in mind. That would be a clearer one. <laughs> uh, I think that, the, yeah, sorry. It, it, it seems to me we, we should continue this discussions on GitHub. Uh, it, it seems that the scope is not yet very clear as well whether it's tab, whether it's system audio and so on. So that's the first thing that should be done. It's the scope. Uh, and then once the scope is clear and there's consensus move. So how do we, how do we, how do we clarify this scope? Because I would like to, you know, make rapid progress here and uh, I still have eight minutes. So maybe you can resolve that question now. You have, you have, how do you suggest that we uh, resolve the question of scope? Um, so I would enumerate the, the different uh, approaches. So there's apparently uh, avoid system surface, true false. There is a display surface, which is yeah, the display surface and whether to include monitor or not. And there might be uh, just <coughs> restrict to tab. I, I don't know, uh, these kind of things. Um, so maybe there's uh, one option that has consensus, like is uh, avoid system audio having consensus, for instance. I think that I think that this would be a bit awkward when we eventually implement window audio, and then, okay, do we introduce avoid window audio too? Well, why why would you want to avoid window audio though? Um, Applicate web developers are creative. Some of the, uh, some users are going oh. to capture the browser window. There could be a lot of reasons for that. So the good thing about having separate uh, properties, uh, separate constraints, is that then the user agent say, "Hey, I'm supporting the uh, this property," which might say, "Oh, oh, so you're actually supporting a recording window, for instance, audio of a window. Oh, you're supporting a recording audio of the system. Oh, you're supporting a recording audio of tab." And uh, currently, there, there's no way, there's no easy way for uh, a web page to, to do that. So if they are trying to convey information, like information to the user, hey, you, you might see this. Uh, so please, please do that. Please click there and so on. They, they might miss some information there. And so having different properties has some advantages as well. So uh, my... Uh personal interest is mostly in uh, avoiding system audio. So any kind of thing, uh, suggestion that would allow that, that would be an okay compromise for me. But I think that, you know, going forward, uh, the most flexible option is the best option. And that is to just uh, allow the web developer to specify which um, sources he's interested in. Uh, and we don't need to think about why, but that's my opinion. So. Uh, Mm -hmm. So going harping back to my echo counseling point, can we say something like um, that this constraint lets you say you only want that checkbox if the source is capable of being echo cancelled? Um, I actually think echo cancellation is a secondary concern. You want to not capture system audio because there's a, because there suddenly might come up uh, voices from the next tab and disclosing uh, that you have been have an incoming call from some uh, person you'd rather not uh, tell the other guy about. But that's also true for um, uh, for window. But it's, I mean, it's, I, I, it's I take your point, there's a privacy concern as well. Um, yeah, but, but it's definitely not about echo cancellation. That was my point. And as uh, Elad says, if we just offer the capability, we don't have to worry about why. But 
if you knew that echo cancellation would work, then maybe you want window. And if you know that it don't doesn't, maybe you don't want to offer it. Like the the way this was presented, and certainly from my experience, the reason you don't want people to pick this is because it sounds terrible, it, it, uh, uh, or at least in in large part. So I I feel like we by not exposing that we're kind of in 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 the constraint we're kind of hiding pretending the problem isn't the problem we it really is well it, it, we're addressing the problems that we're able to address right now when we've got imperfect uh, echo cancellation that's number one and um number two is we don't need to do everything with one api right so an application could using a different api find out okay but which sources would be echo cancelled well and then it could request those or if it's got other uh, criteria for making a decision about which sources it wants, it can, you know, use both uh, sources of information to make the decision. Yeah, but I think that this is a nice place to put this because you're not offering the user something that you're pretty confident won't work. Like, I mean, I, what I like about this is you're, you're, you're stopping the user from choosing something that's going to go bad on them. And I think I claim that at least part of the kinds of things that can go bad, and I take the privacy point, but the other thing that can go bad is, is echo cancelling. And the browser, the user agent is conscious of what it's currently capable of. And therefore, that information is already visible to it and frankly, to nobody else. And so I, I contend that it would be really useful to allow that hint to cover this, the explicitly cover the, can it be echo cancelled properly or not? Um, I'm not an expert on echo cancellation, unfortunately, but the way I understand it, it's not a binary thing, right? It's not you either do perfect echo cancellation or not at all. And it is up to an application to decide whether you, um, whether it's happy with the results. So it, I don't see how the user agent could make that decision uh, on, be, uh, on behalf of the application, given that it, it whatever decision it makes would have to apply to all applications. Um, well, I mean, I don't know the, um, certainly my experience is there are some, like some things echo cancel well and some things don't. and and. And though that is fairly closely tied to whether it's in the browser or whether it's not in the browser at the moment. Uh, we have Yaniva in the queue. Yeah, so um, I think we have uh, the, the, the situation that I'm concerned about is uh, if this API surface as described right here would appear to allow someone to pass in only the monitor value and thus be able to uh, sway the user to picking a full screen capture when they otherwise would have picked a tab capture. That would be really bad. So as long as we can have some language to prevent that, I don't think I care that much about the API surface. Yeah, I think we've agreed on that, the Yanivar. OK. All right, so then I suggest we bike set on, on GitHub. Cool. So can we move on to the last item? Sounds good. OK, so um, crop target uh, and region capture is a, is a new, new API, and it's actively, actively being developed uh, in Chrome. So it, we have some issues that might have an impact on API shape. And it would be great if we could have uh, an understanding of the API shape <clears throat> as soon as possible. So um, there are like three different, uh, there are four issues, but three of them are being discussed right now. Uh, one is whether we want to expose uh, the creation of crop target either to element or media devices. The second one is whether the creation of crop target, we, we want it to be a method or an attribute. 
And the third one is whether we want to return the result of this method as a promise uh, or whether it's async or sync, basically. Next slide. So let's look at all, all of these like in three slides. So <clears throat> uh, first issue is whether we want to attach the API to element itself or media devices. So a crop target is basically uh, an object that is encapsulating uh, a pointer to an element, a remote identifier of, uh, of an element. So we could either uh, call element.getCropTarget and then you, you get your crop target, or as it currently done in Chrome prototype, you would call something like navigator.mediadevices.producecroptarget and pass the element uh, as, as a parameter. So the, the advantages of for media devices option is that uh, you're grouping the API to capture related stuff in a media related place. So it's uh, some might say that it's easing documentation and, and searchability. Uh, the advantages for element is uh, first, uh, in terms of documentation searchability, we, we already have partial interfaces. So for instance, there's element request full screen and request full screen is a kind of media API. And it's it's okay to put it directly on the element because it's tied to the element itself. And uh, the second bonus is that the element and the crop target are tied together, that they are not tied to the media devices itself. And uh, by putting it at the element level and not the media devices, we avoid some, some corner cases. Uh, for instance, uh, media devices is attached to a single document. So you could call media devices produce curve target uh, on an element that is not attached to the same document as the media devices object. And this might have an impact. For instance, the media devices might be neutered if its own document is detached, and then uh, it would throw or it would reject the promise, even though the element is perfectly fine. Uh, and of course, an element might be added or removed from documents. Uh, this is the DOM. But media devices is, is not able to follow. It's tied to a document and will be, it will stick to media devices. Um, a third point is that media devices is secure context and element is not. And you might still want to create a core target for an element in non-secure context. Uh, that's still something that might be uh, possible to use. Um, so my recommendation is to move to element. Uh, there's, as I said, there's no, not a lot of downsides and it seems easier to just call get crop target uh, without any, uh, any parameter. What? Yanival, you're on the queue? Uh, yeah, I agree. I, I think that, uh... The problem with putting it on the media devices is that then we have two relevant objects and we that's more than one what we need. So I think the media devices object here is actually an irrelevant object. So I would look for element. Uh, Elad? Yes, um, I'm voting for media devices. And the reason is, as you have stated, that it is right next to get display media. It provides nice encapsulation of related APIs. And right now, Element has, uh, you've chosen one example of something that is exposed on Element. Uh, the problem is that you've got hundreds of examples, I think, because there are so many things that are currently exposed on Element. And I think that uh, that is, uh, it would be good to stop that. Mm, why? I mean, crop target is being, is being used by media stream track. It's not being used by display media. I'm sorry, so could you say that again? Um, crop target is used by media stream track. It's not used by get display media, for instance. So I do yes. not see why media devices is tied to, uh, to, to that. And, I can... uh, and it's really tied to, to an element, not to its media devices. So I agree you, prefer that it... that you prefer to have some quirks uh for a benefit that is uh what you're claiming documentation so just a so uh you've made uh, two claims here uh number one it is actually um related to get display media because you can only crop something that you got through get display media and that's why it needs to be adjacent in my mind and number two is that um there 
there don't necessarily have to be any side effects to uh, putting it on MIDI devices because call it on one, with one MIDI device or call it with another, it doesn't matter. You get two crop targets. Either you get the same one because you know uh, the, the function actually put it directly on the element behind the scenes or you get equivalent crop targets. It doesn't really matter. That's not true currently on Chrome's implementation. That is true, but it is. Uh, it, it could be true on Chrome's implementation if we take some time to fix it. And also, there is nothing no. preventing us from, from you from uh, implementing I, it like that. I believe that if media devices is neutral, so if the, if its document is detached, uh, you will have difficulties shipping anything but rejecting the promise because that's something that is uh, uh, very natural and is being used a lot. So it it would be counterintuitive to actually uh, undo current Chrome's, Chrome Chrome's behavior and do what you're suggesting. Uh, it is not clear to me why the promise once produced uh, cannot outlive me the devices. Um, that's that's uh, usually what uh, APIs are doing currently on the web. So if you're, if you're calling uh, get user media on an iframe that is detached, then it will reject. And uh, a lot of like all, a lot of promises are, uh, are doing exactly that. And that's that's a web. I don't want to deep, uh, dive too deeply because I know that you've got a couple of more slides and also more people in the queue. Yaniva? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, I was hoping others would have. Uh, I just want to say that I don't see that the media devices object is, has anything to do with uh, what's being captured on the captured side, right? This is where we're in a. Uh, this could be a page that doesn't even have HTTPS. So, yep, and so uh, secure, secure context. Yeah. So this seems like a no brainer to me. I would like to hear how we would, we would solve and why are we not concerned about capture of uh, non secure context? Um, I don't think that non secure contexts are very interesting uh, use cases. I think that those are disappearing quickly. And I don't think that. Uh, anything that you get from a non-secure context should even be trusted in any way. So when you get uh, a crop target from that, I would just ignore it if I were a well-structured application. Points from others? I mean, I... I'm not very deep on the topic, but, but I, I tend to agree that uh, element feels like a more natural target, if only because what you're really doing is getting, uh, I mean, you, you don't even have to pass the element as a parameter as a result. Um, and uh, yeah, right now, I guess I, uh, I'm not finding a lot of strong advantages to using media devices, uh, I think the, Ergonomic argument uh, plays both ways. So, Yuan, would you like to proceed to the next topic? Or... Uh, I would prefer that we uh, we try to get consensus there. Uh, I don't know how we could do that. Uh, I agree. Do you have an idea of how we can proceed? Um, not really, but uh, I will check to see whether it is something that we could compromise on. If though, um, so we can uh, continue on GitHub or get uh, back to this. Uh, at the, I also think that this is not the most important issue that we have here. Because worst case scenario, if we uh, change the decision later, it's not a difficult transition to say, okay, we also expose it on element, and then to say a bit later, and now we only expose it on element. So I see an easy transition there, uh, if necessary. Would this be uh, would it be helpful to ask the tag on this? Because this seems like a fairly simple API mm -hmm. question to me. Whether you have an object with a method or a method on a different object that takes them the object as a parameter. Sure. Uh, I believe the tag has actually discussed this today, and their minutes will eventually be uh, published. OK. 
Okay, so I guess uh, we can wait for the tag input and see uh, well, what they have to say uh, about this and we can re restart the discussions on it's stopping next. Um, so next uh, issue. Um, so in case of exposing API uh, at the element level, so let's say now we expose it to element. Uh, API can either be a method or an attribute. Um, so there are two things there. If you're using an attribute, uh, then you're somehow mandating that the single, single crop target is uh, generated by, by element. So um, while for a method, the usual thing that happens is that you will get a di different crop target every time you call the method. Uh, that's typical from, uh, for web APIs, uh, which means, um, well, so one thing to note is that it's already possible to generate several crop targets that will reference to the same element given crop target is serializable. Uh, I, I don't have a strong opinion there. Uh, initially I was for an attribute, but I would be uh, okay with an element if uh, some people really strong uh, have really strong feelings about it. So let's say it's put at the element, which one would you pick? Red. So uh, I would go with the method, and the reason is that there could be a cost to actually uh, doing that, and they want to dissuade uh, applications from just inspecting that for no reason. And the way that there is a cost for this is that currently uh, what we do is as soon as you uh, mint the crop target, we uh, mark um, the element throughout the rendering pipeline, and that means that the element gets rare data. Uh, rare data is a mechanism by which uh, Chrome makes sure that you know elements are relatively small and only those that need a bit more information actually allocate that extra information. And uh, it's better if those are not created unnecessarily. Um, so I think you said also that you wanted to do lazy uh, surface tagging so that uh, the creation would have almost no cost. You, you, your implementation is, is in, current, in this current state, but uh, I, I think I heard that you were hoping to, to make it lazily uh, tagging. So in that case, your argument uh, would basically... Uh, like that, it, it... Yeah, the lazy tagging would not actually... Uh, res if we put things on element itself, then lazy tagging would be... Okay, it's a bit of a longer discussion because it also depends on in which document it is and then when the element gets moved, okay, because Basically, what you're saying is if you do lazy tagging, then you don't actually tag the element. You just put the tag on the document itself. Um, or as a map, you, you do not need to make the element bigger if you, if you need to. It's just an implementation detail. Um, I would have to think about this, but I still think that um, for so long as some implementations or some reasonable implementations actually have a cost uh, then it, uh, and the side effect, then it makes uh, sense if get crop target is a method just to make that a bit uh, more evident to web developers. Uh, I see Yoniva on the queue. Yeah, so I, again, I, I also, to save some time, I think this should be on the element. It should be an attribute. It should not be a promise so to jump ahead of slide. Uh, I mean, the, I would like to cite the principle, uh, design principle of simplicity. We should prefer simple solutions. And uh, the way I view simplicity is mostly to prefer uh, the priority constituencies being the user and the web developers and all the concerns we've heard so far to pick something other than that have been implementation concerns, which I think uh, as long as this is implementable the right way, we should implement it, uh, the nicest, simplest API. Um, I just want to say that I see the constituencies as a weighted average and not as a, you know, first past the post kind of thing. I think that, yes, it is important. Users don't care here. Web developers barely care about these uh, small differences. It's going to be equally useful for them anyway. So then it actually matters a lot for implementation. Uh, I see Harold is on the queue next. Yeah. I just want to make sure that I have said that I disagree with Janiva on every single point. 
I think uh, get I think uh, messing with element is bad for the web platform. It's already it's already doing far too much. It's a god it's a god object, and uh, uh, the exposing the fact that uh, that uh, these mechanisms have costs is a guide is a guidance to the users that to towards don't don't use them if you if you don't if you don't want to pay that cost and uh, do, doing the promise is uh, uh, this particular interface connects to methods that go between different processes uh, not necessarily get crop target itself it's possible to to use, do that elsewhere but uh, it's also reasonable to have implementations that go between processes and then promise is the right approach. So keep it away from element because element is a bad place to be. Uh, keep, it a, keep it a method because it actually has costs to run it. And keep it a promise because uh, this, that allows implementations that would be impossible if you do it as, a, as an attribute. And it's not that much. It exposes the cost to the user instead of trying to hide it behind something that looks simple but isn't. So, disagreement statement. All right, I'd like to respond. So I, I basically disagree with what everything Harold said. <laughs> Uh, so the, the the cost here sounds like it's in Chrome. There shouldn't be a cost. I think that's a bug because the real name for this should really be to isolate properties here. The attribute should be really transferable reference. That's all it is because the element itself, it wouldn't be needed if we could reference the element directly. So, uh, and that should not be a costly operation. I think that would be a bad implementation to if the user references and creates a lot of crop targets that should not be uh, that should not cause any bad side effects because and just for the other audience here there's nothing that needs this to be a promise because it's not like uh, this would have immediately affect cropping this is just so that uh, we have something to pass to a different process that might be calling crop to where the crop to method is asynchronous and so there's all the time in the world at that level to inspect these these elements, which they really are, whether you know them through a, a reference object like this, which is really what it is. So there's really no need for for the promise or a method, uh, or for this to be on media devices. So I'd yeah. like to to the need to be documented to not choose the simplest API here. Um, I agree with Jan Ibarra there. Uh, I think that we we identified some flaws in Chrome's current implementations. Uh, in terms of uh, memory and so on. Uh, this has been discussed and I think there was consensus and they, there were some changes needed there anyway. And so uh, that, that could change. Uh, I, I'm hoping that it could change your position uh, uh, on Chrome side. Um, but, but in any case, uh, we should look at what, what is being uh, feasible to do in a natural way and what other APIs have done in the past. And other APIs in the past have done have put uh, apis on element because it makes sense other apis in the past have looked at whether it's synchronous or not and if it's uh, if it can be done synchronous they use promises uh, and the same for attribute versus methods so if you if you look at what web ap how web, web apis are consistent and if you want to keep uh, consistency between this api and the other web apis then we should use uh, what other APIs are doing. And over, the good thing about other APIs is that they are implemented. And we know for sure that uh, it's feasible to, to do uh, without too much uh, implementation issue. Uh, Dominique, Dom, you're on the view. Yeah, um, something Yaniva said uh, uh, makes me wonder if, in fact, we should be looking at something that is a transferable reference rather than a crop target. Uh, that's the no, fourth that. issue. <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, are there other APIs that would benefit from having this transferable uh, yeah. targets? 
that's a very okay. good question uh, that I asked on, on GitHub. There's a GitHub issue uh, for that, and uh, that's something we should we should dig in because that would impact the name of crop target, for instance. Exactly. Yeah. Actually, if I could just uh, uh, go a bit over time and answer this, and uh, my argument is that a uh, we've never not uh, identified any such API, but even if we will in the future, it's actually by design that crop targets can only be used for cr uh, cropping because right now you mint that. And you pass that cross uh, uh, to another uh, cross document, right? And you do that with the safety of knowing that it cannot be used for anything in the future that you did not uh, think of as a web developer. So it would be bad design to, in the future, decide that everybody who did cropping is now also trusting the other side for something else. You can check that in the crop to method. That's where you do oh. validity input checking. No, no, no. Because right now, if I, uh, it's the other way around. If I have a crop target and they post it and it exposes more information in the future than me as a web developer who currently saw that it was not exposing any information and they passed it and I thought I was safe, in the future, suddenly it, it turns out that I passed more information than I intended. Not but necessarily more API. information. It might be used in places you, you might not have thought it, it would be used. Yes. And if we... Uh, change the name and we, we change the, the way we, we look at that, then we should take that into account. Thinking, yeah, there might be new APIs, new places, and it should be safe. Uh, there should It should be safe to use uh, the same object on, on the two APIs. But those future unsafe APIs need to be written. So we, we could make sure to not make them unsafe. Well, or... uh, if we, the, the one problem here is that you're suggesting include, uh, Suggesting and uh, creating a completely general mechanism that can have many possible uh, possible applications and uh, using that as a, uh, as a, and which can have lots of implications that uh, cannot be evaluated because they don't exist yet and using that to block a very narrow and specific interface that is going to be used for one thing only. I'm not sure we are, we are the right group to and uh, to introduce very very wide ranging interfaces like an ele an element reference that can be used used cross that cross process. Well, but uh, but we are. We're just talking about naming. Uh, may I point out that we are over time now? Um, so how should we proceed then, Bernard? No, the issues have been discussed for like uh, one, one or two months, and basically, uh, I think that uh, in terms of implementers, we we are pretty clear about what people think, but we need still to make a decision. It feels to me that there is a narrow crop target discussion and the broader platform integration question, um, and maybe we can start with the. the solution to the narrow thing uh, and evaluate whether there is a, a migration path to maybe the right solution if there is a different right solution uh, and working on the right solution i think uh, as Harold suggested probably requires uh, reaching out to uh, a group that would be the right place for this broader solution uh, but that again would require i think um, working through this other potential API uh, users of this uh, broader concept. Well, I, I think that's a mischaracterization of one position here, though. I think we're, we're saying, we're not saying this should be a broader solution. We're saying these are the standard web patterns that API has influenced API design for a long time. And there's no need to, we shouldn't depart from those uh, standards without good reason. And I don't think we've heard good reason from implementing. So to, to be clear, my, my point was, uh, I think the, the API shape until we discuss the name uh, is definitely something where we should follow the core path. Okay, um, but, but if we are looking at broadening the scope of crop target, then I think we are starting a very different conversation, one that I find very interesting, but a diff very different one. Yeah, so that's why it was separated. For yeah. this meeting, it was separated. It was API shape, and there was this fourth issue that we might talk later, but not for this meeting. I don't think anyone's blocking on on the name.
Oh, okay. Uh, by the way, um, in one of the emails, if I'm not mistaken, about call for consensus, the name was actually brought up as a blocking concern. So, uh, and by UN and Yanivar, you agreed. So, Yanivar, no, I'm, I'm hearing that you are not going to block on the name now. UN, what about you? Um, as I said, I raised the concern that there was there were some issues and that they should be documented. That's that's what's uh, my concern, and I think we resolved it by saying, "Hey, we are not sure about the naming," and that's that's a good solution for me right now. I think that uh, we should try to solve these issues on time, and I'd like to focus on these three issues there, which is sync or not sync, element or not, uh, or media devices, and attribute or method, because these three are pretty uh, specific, isolated, and we should be good. Uh, we we are the WebRTC working group that should. Uh, make the decision there. And uh, my understanding is that we have uh, identified that uh, if we look at the patterns that are used currently in the web APIs, then we have a natural choice. And that's the one I would push for using. I agree. So, um i'm not sure how we can make progress uh, um, there's, there's <clears throat> the tag information for the first issue but for the uh second and third issue uh i'm not sure the tag will give input or by the way was, um, was it mentioned as well so tag already uh approved the entire design before and now they've been yeah. asked to uh weigh in on those particular issues and uh, so all three of them? they say all, hmm? all three of them all three yes. of them okay yes. cool um, but let's say that they come back and the answer is not totally conclusive and nobody changes their mind. I suggest that um, one way that we could proceed is that we can have this uh, particular API um, accepted. We go with that and we consider migration paths in the future when it's uh, when Mozilla and uh, Apple have also implemented this, are ready to ship it and say, hey, this is now um, uh, synchronous for us. And uh, so sure. that's one option. Another sure. one is that you, you could always uh, polyfill this, you know? So it, it's much easier to polyfill one in one direction, right? Like you can make sure that the um, non, uh, the asynchronous, uh, I'm sorry, the I, synchronous I, one can make it Okay. Okay. Uh, and I guess we are way out of time, so. Um... So Charles will convene and propose a pass forward. Um, yeah, so uh, we might be at, this, at the point where opinion polls might be useful because given the given that Tag has already reviewed this, it doesn't seem to be all that chance, great chance of uh, waiting for another Tag review of the specific questions. But uh, Oh, so, no, so to, people, people, to, to uh, clarify, my, my third chair has the, the, the one chair that does, isn't strongly opinionated on the matter seems to have dropped off. So, we might have to yeah, take this back to the chair's meeting. Uh, uh, and I think we need to adjourn having lost uh, more than half of the participants. So. I think the polyfill question is actually a place to attack it from next next time it, we, we, we meet. I think that that actually might resolve might narrow the the answer space okay uh one quick question uh how would uh, an opinion poll uh, help here given that we know everybody's opinions right like well uh, there might be some there might be people who don't uh, haven't spoken up yet. You, you don't know my opinion because <laughs> yes, I, but... I, I don't either <laughs> as you can see that is correct, but if you knew, for example, that you could have it tomorrow if your opinion changed, then like I, I'm not sure uh, I'm, there are browsers, right? Browser vendors have one set of uh, criteria and web developers have another and different web developers might change their mind based on, okay, how quickly can I have it? And I, it's unclear to me how to evaluate such opinions. Well, uh, I mean, I can give you the way this has been looked at, at the, in the tag before, uh, the future is longer than the past. 
And so if it's gaining one month of availability uh, against having a bad API forever, <laughs> Or a bad API that is hard to move away from, then, then I think the calculation points towards uh, taking a, an additional month. But of course, uh, nothing is that black and white. But, but, but just to say that time to market uh, is a pretty weak argument for rushing a design in general for, for the platform. No, I meant that the web developer would want to have it sooner and therefore it would care because in this particular case, I think that the web de web developers would not actually care about the shape, right? The shapes are almost identical as far as the web developer is concerned. Yeah, so and that I think is a reasonable argument. I mean, I, there is a cost in the mental model if uh, indeed you don't you can't use your existing understanding of the platform to navigate that specific API, but, but I, in this particular case, I don't disagree with you that the mental cost is pretty limited. Okay, I think we need to end the call. Yeah. And we, the chairs will discuss further about how to resolve these issues. Okay, thank See you. you. Recording. Settings.